We're so glad you're joining us as we're going through the Gospel of Luke, looking at the meals that Jesus ate with people and what some of those meals meant and some of the significance of them. Today we're actually going to be in Luke chapter 22. We're going to be looking at a meal that has great meaning. It's in this meal that Jesus sends his disciples into Jerusalem and tells them to prepare this Passover in the upper room, gives them specific instructions which is, are followed to the tea, and the people gather, and Jesus takes this Passover meal and turns it from what it once was into something he wants it to be and how he wants it to be about him. And so today as we go through this meal, we'll look at some of the things that are significant about what it embodies and the actions that it involves. We'd love to have you come and worship with us at the Lincoln Church of Christ, Lincoln, Nebraska. God bless. Pray with me. Good morning, Father. What a beautiful Sunday morning, especially in the month of July when it's been like it was this last week and then you throw this 80 degree weather in all part of your creation be with those that are not here due to health reasons personal reasons only you know just be with them thank you for everyone that it is here and let them be touched in their heart by the singing, the lesson, conversation with a fellow parishioner. Be with Dan as he gives his lesson this morning. Let us take something out and spread it. Bring more people to you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Our reading this morning, Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them, apart from the crowd. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he, carry, that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room, prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. I want to share this quote as we begin. The Lord's Supper is the world in miniature, but it has cosmic significance. Within it, we find clues to the meaning of all creation and all history, to the nature of God, to the nature of man, to the mystery of the world, which is Christ. Through the table stands, though the table stands at the center, its effects stretch out to the four corners of the earth. The Supper. This is a fifth Sunday if you're visiting with us on every fifth Sunday occasion that we have in the year, we spend that service time especially looking at elements of the Lord's Supper, which is what we will, we will be doing today. I have a question just to get our minds fired up a little bit. If we stop celebrating communion, what difference would it make in your life? 
If we stop doing this, what difference would it make in your life? Is it just an act of Sunday morning? Or does it really make a difference? So today we actually do not even have to deviate from our theme of the meals with the master. Because Luke records this meal with the master. As Paul just read that the, uh, the Lord made preparation to have this meal with his disciples. Let's continue on at that same opening, beginning at verse 14. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying this cup, which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with me on, this ta on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to argue among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. As we think about the 22nd chapter of Luke, and the meal that has special meaning that Jesus desired to have with his disciples. We know that this is the Jewish Passover. We know that it underlines uh, this particular meal. As a matter of fact, Luke reminds us that this meal is the Passover five different times in the text that we've read this morning. So he is, is wanting us to understand that what's happening here is the Jewish Passover. The Passover is um, decisively, the Last Supper is decisively connected to the first Passover. So the Last Supper and the first Passover are intricately tied together. As we think about that, there are some, some similarities that I would like to just mention as we begin. Number one is, this was a commanded feast. Commanded feast. If you read through the 10 plagues that God brought upon Egypt to convince Pharaoh to let the people go, you will notice that some of those plagues also came upon Israel. You see, God didn't just have to convince Pharaoh. He had to convince his people. For 400 years, they had been intertwined with the Egyptian gods and goddesses. They had lost sight of Jehovah God. And so he needed to reaffirm himself to them as well. And so this was a commanded observance that God gives in this last plague upon the people. Israel would have been bound by this last plague. And so God provided a way of them to escape. He provided them an opportunity to make a sacrifice. Even more important, I think, is the fact that this was not a last minute thing. It was a planned pro progress. The Hebrew word actually means a feast observed by a pilgrimage. It has to do with a journey. And very much the first Passover was a journey because it just didn't start that night when they killed a lamb. It started seven days before when they had to start getting rid of yeast. They had to clean the house. They had to be ready. So they had to have a belief that God meant what he said and they were gonna keep the commands that God gave them. And so they began to ready themselves, ultimately coming to the point where they would sacrifice an unblemished lamb. They had to specifically, again, follow those commands. They couldn't offer a blemished lamb and expect God was going to, to ratify that. They had to offer this perfect lamb. And then that blood had to be taken with a, a branch of hyssop and it had to be wiped upon their doorpost. And then they had to stay inside of that. Then God would pass over them when it came to the death of the firstborn. So that's similar to the supper. It's a command. We read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Paul says that Christ said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. So it's a commanded aspect. But again, we just don't come here and boom, do the command. It's a process. And this Corinthian letter talks about examining ourselves and being in connection with Christ. It talks about being in fellowship with one another. And so it's a whole process, not just the taking of a little bit of unleavened bread and drinking of a cup. It's a process, just like it was originally. Both of these feasts also focus on bread and blood as needed ingredients for purity and redemption. The bread was to not have yeast, and we know that the New Testament oftentimes refers to yeast as the influence of sin. And so there's the removal of sin, the purification of oneself. But then I want to focus more on the blood. The blood was the main ingredient that was sprinkled on the doorpost. The blood is the main ingredient that we find screaming at the supper of the Lord. Peter says that we need to know that we've not been redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from this feudal conduct inherited from our forefathers. But he says we've been bought with the precious blood of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. We've been redeemed by blood, by blood. In Hebrews, it says, how much more will the blood of Christ, after it talks about people being sprinkled with blood in the Old Testament for cleansing, he says, how much more is the blood of Christ going to do that through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleansing your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant, a new way. This blood brought the new covenant. This blood also enables our conscience to be clean, to be clean. So again, we're back to this purification, the bread, the blood. Peter even draws this connection. He says, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but what? It's our appeal for a clean conscience. What the Hebrew writer say happens? Blood gives us a clean conscience. What's Peter say? Baptism gives us the blood of Christ, which results in a clean conscience. The time between the blood of, of Christ and baptism. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus said that he's going to shed his blood, quote, for the remission of sins, unquote. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when Peter addresses a group of Jews and convinces them of the death of Christ that they were instrumental in causing, they are pricked to the heart. And they said, what should we do? And Peter says they need to be baptized, quote, for the remission of sins. We look at how in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, it is said that we have been reconciled to God through, quote, the death of the Son, unquote. We look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, where it says, quote, we are baptized into his death, end of quote. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, it says that we've been, quote, washed. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. And we look at how in Acts chapter 22, Ananias comes to Paul. And after three days of prayer and fasting and concentrating on his own sinfulness, Ananias says, you need to be baptized and, quote, wash away your sins. Do you see a connection between blood and baptism? I'm going to give you some syllogisms. We had a teacher at school, when you, when you miss a, when misdid this, he called them syllogisms. But a syllogism is a, is, a, is a means of logical conclusion. It's where two propositions are shared, and there's a common truth within each one, which then results in a conclusion drawn from both. And it can be true. So let's try to make some syllogism. Jesus shed, said he shed his blood, quote, for the remission of sin in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. Peter told the crowd that they should be baptized for the remission of sins. Therefore, it is in the action of baptism that one receives the remission of sins offered through the blood of Christ. Jesus said, my blood is for the remission of sins. Peter said, baptism is what puts you in connection with the blood and gives you remission of sins. 
Reconciliation to God is made possible through the death of his son, according to Romans 5 and verse 10. And that death is what in, in that death Jesus shed his blood. And so Paul will say that when one is buried in water, that they are, quote, baptized into his death. Baptized into his death. Our conclusion, therefore, it is the action of baptism. In the action of baptism, one completely connects with the death of Christ and thus becomes reconciled by Christ's blood. And the third one, John states that Jesus' blood washed us from our sins, or washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1 and verse 5. Paul is told after his own prayer and sorrow that he needs to be baptized in order to wash away his sins. I just want you to notice, Paul's been struck blind. He's been in Damascus for three days before Ananias comes. He's been praying and fasting according to scripture. No mention of a sinner's prayer that saved him. No mention of sorrow that saved him. Ananias shows up and says, Paul, you need to wash away your sins in baptism. And so Paul's sins were washed away by Christ's blood when he obeyed God's directive and was baptized. So although this feast the Passover has bread and blood in it. For you and I, as we come to the supper of the Lord, what Jesus is telling his disciples is his body is going to be sacrificed. His blood is going to be shed. And the purpose for his shed blood is to redeem mankind. And just like in the Passover, there were things had to be done before one could be saved by the blood. There are still things that have to be done in a believer's heart before the blood can save them. We have to believe the word of God. We have to understand what he says. We have to be willing to change our life, to stop the yeast of our life. We need to come to the one who promises deliverance. He's sacrificed himself. He's offered his blood. We have to come in contact with his blood so it can be put on our doorpost so that when the Lord passes over, he passes over us as well. <laughs> I want to mention just three things that the supper embodies. And the first one is it embodies a strong regard. And I'm talking about that this supper is about you. This supper is about Jesus and you. As we look to the context of Luke, he actually uses the word you very often. Now, obviously, he's talking to a plural of people. But each of those plural people equals one person. And so as Jesus says, I want you to take this, it's a challenge to us individually. Jesus said he desires with a desire, I earnestly desires how most translate it, but it's actually the same Greek word. I desire with strong desire to eat this with you. On the first day of the week, when we come together and we celebrate this meal, Jesus wants to eat this with you. He is here to share this with you. Jesus will eat with you in the kingdom of God. It's what he says. I'm not going to do this again until the kingdom of God comes. Kingdom of God is here. We're part of that kingdom of God. Jesus wants to eat this meal with us. He says, my body was given for you. I have regard for you. I'm giving my body for you. It's going to suffer. And then he also says, I'm going to give my blood. It's given for you. So the first thing that we recognize in this meal is that Jesus has a very high regard for each of his children. Secondly, the supper embodies redemption. It embodies redemption. The entire nature of the Passover was to focus upon redemption through the Passover lamb's blood. It was to celebrate redemption. Jesus, as the unblemished sacrifice, will become that Passover lamb for you. He's proven unspotted by the testimony of people that tell the truth. Oh, the Jews are spreading lies about him. They're gathering false witnesses. But what does Pilate say? Don't find any fault in him. What's Herod say? Don't find any fault in him. He's proven to be unblemished, unspotted. And then he's tested in his own purity by the pre-crucifixion suffering. When he's mistreated, he's spat upon, he's beaten. And scripture says he doesn't answer a word. 
doesn't answer a word. Just allows those things to happen. They test him for who he is. And then he is slain. He is crucified. And after his death, he is pierced. The Bible says that blood and water are shed in that piercing. This also embodies reliance. We are to eat this according to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, until he comes. So in this supper, we rely on the fact that he's coming back. He's coming back. That really boils down to nothing but hope. Hope. El peace is the Greek word for hope, and it means a favorable or confident expectation. It's not a wish like what you want for your birthday. This is a confident expectation. It's there. It's mine. I've laid hold of this. I'm relying upon this. Romans chapter 8 says that hope is not hope if it's what? If it's seen. And so we have a hope that is not visible we have a hope that's based upon the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what the supper is intended to remind us of, that we have a hope. We also have a hope that's in the future. We eagerly wait for this. And so we know it's ahead of us. And we look with great anticipation. It's a hope that is rooted in God's faithfulness. A hope of eternal life, which the God who cannot lie promised. It's a hope in the faithfulness of God. And lastly, it's a hope that's proven by the fact that God raised Jesus. In other words, what Peter says here is that God raised him up from the dead and he gave him glory so that our faith and our hope could be in God. God raised up Jesus just like he plans to raise up his children. This meal is an act of certain things. It's an act of recall. Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, he says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. I want you to recall me. Remembrance is an interesting word. It's compounded in the Greek language from the word up and also the word to remind or to recall. What's interesting is, is how that all comes together in what it meant uh, to people when they heard that. Because it, I, the idea that is in it is you take something that's in the back and you bring it to the front. And there, you call it to mind at the present. So what's to be in the back of every believer's mind? It's the sacrifice of Jesus. And what the supper's intended to do is to take that fact that we live with daily and to bring it right now to the present. And you know, that's, that's what the power of this meal is. That's, that's why when Paul wrote to Corinth and they were, they were divisive in the observance of the Lord's Supper and they had thoughts and intents against brothers and sisters in Christ, that's why it doesn't work. Because if you're going back and you're bringing Christ up right now to the present, none of that matters. And so forgiveness has to become a reality. Acceptance needs to become a reality. And so you take this in the back and you bring it to the present. And that's what the meal is supposed to help us do, to recall. It's also a, an act of relationship. It's an act of relationship. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul will say, It's not the cup of blessing which we bless, a sharing in the blood of Christ, and the bread in which we break, a sharing in the body of Christ. He says there's one bread, there's one body, and we all take the same thing. So he's talking about us being one. The word that is used there is the word koinonia, which means sharing, means communion. It has to do with an intimate connection. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, we're having intimate connection with everybody else who's doing the same thing because there is one body and there's one cup. And isn't it amazing that all across the world on the first day of the week that there are saints gathering who are remembering this, they're recalling this, they're acting this bringing Christ forward and they're remembering we have fellowship with one another, a participation, a social connection. It's also defined as a partnership. Vine's expository dictionary actually says it's a fellowship recognized and enjoyed. Thus it is used of the common experiences and the interest of Christians. There's a commonality 
So as we have the supper, we act as though we're one because we are one. And then lastly, it's also a meal with the action of repetition. You know, it's interesting how many people say, you do that every week as though there's something wrong with repetition. Well, you do it every six months? You do it every year? You know, there's nothing wrong with repetition. Now, Jesus condemns vain repetition. But this is intended to be something that happens continuously. On the first day of the week, when we had gathered together to break bread, Paul begins to preach. First day of the week, gathered together. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. when you come together. Verse 18, when you come together. Verse 33, when you come together. So when the church came together, they repeated this. When they assembled on that first day of the week, they came together and they brought Christ forward. And everybody thought about him in the present. Repetition. Repetition. Nothing in the world wrong with repetition. And this meal embodies the highest regard that Christ has for each of us. He does not desire for any of us to perish but for all to come to eternal life. The redemption that's been provided for us has been provided at the expense of Jesus Christ. One of the things you may have noticed in our reading through Luke chapter 22 is there's more than one cup involved at the supper because the Passover usually involve four cups and sometimes five. And each of those cups meant something different taken from a passage in the Old Testament of what God said he would do for the people as he brought them out of Egyptian slavery. This is, first of all, I'll bring you out. So the first cup represented coming out. He says, I will redeem you or I will deliver you. The second cup represented deliverance. The third cup, I will redeem you. And the fourth cup, I will, I will take you out. I will take you. It's believed that the cup that Jesus used at the supper to speak of his own blood was the cup of redemption. We know that he'd already distributed one cup. But the cup of redemption was his blood. And he says, you need to remember that I redeem you. And also the reliance that we have that our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in our satisfaction. Our, our hope is not in us. Our hope is in the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if I'm in Jesus, I get the same privilege. And Jesus was raised to glory. And I will be raised to glory if I'm in him. That is our hope. The meal embodies that. And the meal also involves acts of recalling that mystery of Christ that brought about our redemption, bringing that to the forefront of our minds and thinking about that. It also involves relationships. We are connected with each other because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And also the repetition, repetition that we repeatedly take what is in the background and make it the priority of our life. And that's what we do as we celebrate the supper.